But yeah. while, while while we're here in this moment of community, um, I just want to really emphasize because that's what my program is about. It's about connection, and and this is this is such a wonderful example when we can't do what we used to do. But this is even better because look how far and wide we are connected, and I think it's great. That's true. Well, welcome everybody. Shalom aleichem from wherever you are. My name is Vivian Felsen, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you today on behalf of the Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish. Ich heiße Vivian Felsen, und es ist mein Groß Covid und mein Groß Vergnügen, euch zu begrüßen in Nomen von unser Komitee für Yiddish bei der Toronto Yiddische Föderation. Um, please note that much of the content in today's program, although much of the content is in Yiddish, the presentation is going to be in English. So before we begin, as Mary told you, please put any questions or comments that you may have into our Q&A box, not the chat box. And the speaker, uh, Karen, will have the opportunity to answer your questions after her presentation. I'm now going to turn the proceedings over to the CEO and founding director of the California Institute for Yiddish Culture and Language in Los Angeles, the popular Yiddish instructor, translator, poet, and the organizer of today's event, Miri Koral. Herzlichen Dank, Vivian. Everyone, seid begrüßt. Welcome, everyone from all over the world. It is fantastic that you're all here. As Karen said, uh, for us to be all connected in this way, in a very Yiddish way, yeah, transnational. <laughs> uh, so it is. It is my great uh, privilege. It is my uh, uh, COVID uh, to be sharing this event. Uh, with our amazing host, with uh, the UJA, uh, the Toronto UJA Committee uh, for Yiddish, uh, especially Vivian Felsen, my my uh, co-conspirator in in this program, and I just want to also point out that we have an amazing technical support, background support in every way from Sharon Power uh, of of the UJA Committee in Toronto as well. Uh, this program. Uh, which I know you will all enjoy tremendously, is an example of something that uh, Cycle has prided itself in, Cycle being the California Yiddish Institute uh, from the get-go, which is to really highlight the full spectrum, the full riches uh, of Yiddish culture. And um, this is, this is uh, today is going to be one beautiful example of that. So before I, I go into formal introduction of Karen, which uh, um, I will do in a second, I wanna say first and foremost, Karen Goodman is a beautiful dancer. And you will have a chance to see some of this toward the end of this program when, when she shows a very special film. And of course, as a dancer, she has received many, many, um, accolades, uh, which I will tell you about in a moment. But secondly, the fact that she has taken an interest in Yiddish dance is really a great boon uh, for us all. And thirdly, that she has become a maven in filmmaking uh, just makes it all even more uh, incredible for us because it's a wonderful means of not only safeguarding Yiddish culture, which is what we're all about, but also as a means of creating uh, new Yiddish culture. And this is, this is uh, really our, also our goal, to stimulate uh, continuing creativity in Yiddish language and culture. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Karen. Uh, she produced, directed, and wrote the documentary on Yiddish dance, which is called Come Let Us Dance. You'll see a, a tiny bit of that in the beginning of this presentation. 
and the experimental documentary short Die Book Remix Dancing Between Worlds, uh, which you will also see uh, toward the end of this presentation, which she wrote, directed, and performed. And it was recently an official selection at six international film festivals. She speaks on Yiddish folk dance and on dancer choreographers working at the intersection of Jewish identity and modern dance, some of whom she has interviewed on video for an intended archive. Her biographies on dancer choreographer Bela Lewitsky and Margalit Oved are in the Encyclopedia Judaica. Her article on Benjamin Zemach was published in USC's Institute of Modern Russian Culture Journal, Experiment. And she distributes the 1969 film, The Art of Benjamin Zemach, and her own film at YiddishDances.com. Make a note of that, everyone. Maybe uh, we'll write it in the, in the Q&A, YiddishDances.com. A critically acclaimed performer, choreographer, Honors include a National Endowment for the Arts Choreographers Fellowship, grants from Los Angeles City and the County, the Lester Horton Award for Individual Performance. She studied and danced with Michael Alpert, Zev Feldman, and Steve Weintraub, and was archival videographer for the dance classes at Yiddish Summer Weimar in 2011 and 12. She has choreographed 40 works, several with Jewish themes and five full length solos. She danced with postmodern master Rudy Perez in New York and LA and taught at her LA studio dance works for 21 years, as well as stints at LA County High School for the Arts, Cal Arts and Caltech amongst others. She has an MA in dance from UCLA. So you can all see that you are in very, very good hands for this upcoming presentation. And I just wanna give a very quick shout out to any of my UCLA Yiddish film students who are in attendance. Welcome, glad you're here. And now over to Karen's presentation. I hope dank. There is nothing more real, yet more elusive than dance. Real as the bodies it lives in, elusive as the spirit that moves them. Fragile as those bodies that age, forget, are destroyed or exiled. Varied as time and circumstance. I was thinking about the past when I wrote that 22 years ago. That's where we often look for clues to the present. Now the present provides context. So I'll start with the October 2022 dance review by Jennifer Homans in the New Yorker magazine and work my way back to the past. First, she mentions UNESCO's survey of cultural buildings already destroyed in the Ukraine war, including religious sites, theaters, museums, historic buildings, monuments, and libraries. Then she asks, what about the dances? This is harder to calculate because dance is essentially stored in bodies, like dancer, soldier, Oleksandr Shapoval of the National Opera of Ukraine, who died in combat along with the dances he contained. Maybe choreographer Alexei Ratmansky had this in mind for his wartime elegy, which premiered September 2022 in Seattle with the Pacific Northwest Ballet. Dedicated to the people of Ukraine, it was his first work after the Russian invasion. During opening night bows, Ratmansky unfurled a Ukrainian flag and held it high over his head. Elegy opens and ends with sections that refer to loss and joy. 
Its backdrops are by Ukrainian Jewish artist Matvey Weisberg, who has worked with the Jewish and protest themes. The central section is based on Ukrainian folk dance, backed by the folk art of Maria Primichenko, whose work has also become a symbol of the current resistance. Ratmansky, one of today's foremost international ballet choreographers, was born in 1968 to a Ukrainian Jewish father and Russian mother. He grew up in Kyiv, where his parents still live. He trained in Moscow at the Bolshoi Ballet, but returned at 18 to dance with the National Ballet of Ukraine and began choreographing. He later directed the Bolshoi from 2004 to 2008. In Moscow to stage a new work for the Bolshoi, he fled the day the invasion began and will not return. He then helped form the United Ukrainian Ballet Company, based in The Hague, on whom he recently set his version of the 1841 ballet Giselle. A source of the ballet's story is Jewish-born poet Heinrich Heine's mention of spirits called willies in his 1830s survey of German mythology. Willies are the returning spirits of virginal women who die before their weddings. The ballet is about the tragedy that can lurk in hidden identities and the power of love to defy death, both also themes in the Dybbuk. My maternal grandparents were from Ukraine, Berdichev. I knew little of them or of my father's parents from Bielsk and Bucharest. So about 25 years ago, I thought to at least learn how they might have danced at Simchas. I have an MA in dance and have seen folk dance from all over the world. Yet to know so little of my grandparents' dances just felt wrong. It's been an adventure. Dance workshops, Yiddish class, research, interviews, writing, teaching, choreographing, from folk materials. But in 2016, on a Poland tour, it all came together with the instinct to bind my identities as this later in life student of Yiddish dance and culture, and as a later in life concert dancer. How else? But by dancing. But let me go back to 1999. I was in a performance of professional dancers over the age of 40, where we each told a brief dance story. A woman my mother's age told of being in a Jewish theater and dance company here in LA. In the dressing room, I told her of my mission. Miriam Rocklin was so knowledgeable and charming that I felt compelled to film her. I wasn't a filmmaker, but if this was just for my education, Dayenu, it would be enough. It turned out pretty well, and Come Let Us Dance has had an ongoing life as a Yiddish dance resource since 2002. Women wore the skirts and they put the shoulder forward, they put their head over their shoulder, and the next one this way, and the next one this way and the next one this way, so that it becomes a little bit of a flirtatious, you know, showing off. Hands. Now the hands are terribly important in the Eastern Jewish dance. All you have to do is stand in front of the synagogue on Friday night or some Saturday morning and see, to see them talk. The Jewish gesture with the open hands, the closed hands, with the eyes, and this, and oh my God, and what that. They're talking with their hands. They used to say, and the Jew sits on his hand, he stutters. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam had known two important Polish-born dancer-choreographer teachers working from Jewish tradition, Nathan Wazanski and Benjamin Zemach. More about them shortly. I also bought a copy of the 1937 Yiddish language film, The Dybbuk, 
to learn the several authentic Yiddish dances in it. And I began to learn about S. Ansky, who wrote the original play. I've loved dance since I was three, so I've had plenty of time to think about its value. In dance, the instrument of the body gives shape to thought and feeling, embodying the past, present, and future of the dancer, signifying both identity and change. Dance embodies mystery. We have the mysterious ability, kinesthesia, to feel the movement of others even when we ourselves are still. Perhaps this is what suggests that there is some connective tissue, something greater than ourselves that we are part of. Dance is not just about moving, it is about being, because it lives in the dimensions that life inhabits, time, space, gravity. When these elements are fully engaged, moving or watching, there is the chance to marvel and somehow feel transformed, the self taken by the body beyond its limits to that realm of spirit. And it is our bodies that ask the existential questions. What is needed to survive? What actions should we take to influence or celebrate a positive outcome or lament a loss? Life, death, what does it all mean? For me, this is where dance, ritual, and religion meet. How this came to be expressed by the Ashkenazim was my question. Written Jewish dance history starts in Torah and Talmud. There are words in Torah for whirling, gyrating, skipping, limping, leaping, trembling, and more. Baruch, praised or blessed, comes from berach, knee or to kneel. A word for holiday is chag, a journey or pilgrimage, cousin to the Arabic word hajj, the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. There is also Miriam dancing after crossing the Red Sea, and David dancing so ecstatically that he sheds his clothes as he leads the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem for the first time. It is a positive commandment, a mitzvah, to attend the bride, accord her honor, praise her, dance for her, provide for her, make her happy. It also tells that to bring joy, Rabbi Samuel ben Isaac danced and juggled three myrtle branches. Myrtle symbolized beauty, good luck, hope, immortality, justice, and sweetness. Rav Acha danced with the bride on his shoulders. True or mythic, wedding dancing is a consecration of the transformation of the couple's identity and new family connections. And for the mystics, a symbol of the union between the male and female aspects of the divine. Although the ancient dances were lost, new ones grew wherever Jews lived, including the Pale of Settlement, because they were needed. Lodge born and raised, Nathan Vizansky, writing in 1954, quoted an old Yiddish proverb, a yid vetzich nisht avek lozen tansen glat A Jew does not let himself go a-dancing without reason. In 1930, Vizansky became the first to write about and analyze Yiddish dance in the U.S. Raised Hasidic and Cheder educated, his childhood also included ballet classes, reading Yiddish translations of Western literature, and living through the political and social upheavals of strikes, arrests, and pogroms of Lodz. He won a ballet scholarship in 1913 to Germany, 
but the study and performing he pursued there were cut short by World War I. In 1920, he came to the U.S. Although he choreographed on Jewish themes, his most important contribution is his 1942 book, Ten Jewish Folk Dances, written in Chicago. It features the work of Ukrainian-born artist Todros Geller and Berlin-born liturgical composer Max Janowski, who arranged the traditional music. I thank his daughter, Phyllis Funari, for his materials. In the book, Vizansky gives a version of that Talmudic mitzvah dance, which he calls the kosher dance, quote, in which the purified bride is therefore a kosher bride. The dance is a great event and it is customary to make the most of it, calling the father, the rabbi, or important community figures to dance with her, to signify that they are entrusting her to the groom. Placed in the center of the room, with her face veiled, each of them in turn takes the opposite end of the handkerchief she holds and dances with her." Unquote. I'll add that via handkerchief, they connect the past, these older men, the present, the new family connections, and the future, the children to come who will continue to praise the divine, identity and change. Miriam Rocklin had Vizansky's book because in Los Angeles, Benjamin Zemach brought in Vizansky, also living then in LA, to teach the dances to his company. Zemach had been in the Habima Theater's premiere of the Dybbuk in Moscow in 1922. Both of these men carried in their bodies the way Ashkenazic Jews gestured and danced. In 1969, Miriam produced a half-hour documentary which shows four dances he choreographed between the 1920s and 50s. Underlying the choreography is the geschmack, flavorful authenticity that both men had. In my best moments, it seems I always felt that something comes through me. It is a representation, either of the past, or of the people, or of the present. It's going to the roots. It's a matter of the work and what you do being larger and bigger than yourself. So, S. Omsky, what inspired him to write the Dybbuk? Born into Hasidic tradition in Belarus and Hader educated until age 12, he leaves school to help his abandoned mother run a tavern in Vitebsk. He is hired to tutor Chaim Zhidlovsky and they become lifelong friends, helping to found the Socialist Revolutionary Party. 
In 1908, Zhidlovsky becomes vice president of the Chernovitz Yiddish Language Conference that declares Yiddish a national language of the Jewish people. Earlier, Ansky rejects his Jewish identity and transfers his concerns for humanity to the rural peasants and miners of the Russian Empire and begins writing about them when he's 19. At 23, he lives three years in Ukraine's Donbass region, working in salt and coal mines to better understand and report on the miners' lives. He believes they are key to Russia's future and often reads publicly to them. He's also a radical anti-Tsarist and spends 14 years in Paris and Switzerland writing on intellectual and economic life for Russian newspapers. Meanwhile, the Yiddish literary scene has grown. The stories of I.L. Parrots of the spirituality of poor rural Jews draw Ansky back to Yiddish. And everything he's done for the Russian poor, he now wants to do for his own people. After years of Russian ethnography, Jewish ethnography becomes his way back. In 1912, his Jewish ethnographic expedition begins. Ansky's team of three or four rotating people collect ritual and other objects. They take 2,000 photos, write down 1,800 folk tales, 1,500 folk songs, 1,000 melodies, and record 500 wax cylinders. There was also a questionnaire of 2,087 questions. A few related to dance, such as, describe how the kosher dance of the community men with the bride takes place. Do people dance with a handkerchief? Is there a farewell dance for leading the groom's family back to the inn? List all the Jewish dances you know and describe how they take place. Unfortunately, all the questionnaire's answers were lost. The expedition went to Volhynia and Podolia, the cradle of Hasidism, both in Ukraine. Podolia is where the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, was born in 1698. His connection to nature and a simple life kept him in the Carpathian Mountains and influenced his approach, which included dance as meditation and celebration. His great-grandson, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, born in 1771, died in Uman and was buried there in 1810. Until this current war, plane loads of his followers still gathered on Rosh Hashanah at his grave to pray all day and dance all night at a nearby hall, moving in concentric circles with the best dancers in the center, building up speed and athleticism as they go. His fantastical and metaphorical stories were published after his death, including the mountain and the heart of the world that is told in the Dybbuk. It is during the expeditions that Ansky conceives the Dybbuk and completes it in 1915. Written in Russian for Konstantin Stanislavsky's Moscow Art Theater, it is approved for production in 1917. But World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution intervene. Opposing Bolshevism, Ansky leaves again, this time for Vilna. He connects with the Vilner Truppe, a Yiddish art theater company, who want to stage the Dybbuk, but in Yiddish. They all move to Warsaw, where he translates it, all the while politically writing and organizing aid for Jews. Ill with diabetes and angina, he dies suddenly in Warsaw, in 1920 at age 57. The Wilner Truppe stages the play's premiere there as a memorial. He is buried in Warsaw alongside Peretz and novelist Jacob Dinizon. 
The next company to perform Dybbuk is Habima Theater, founded by Nahum Zemach in Bialystok in 1912. As Jewish nationalists and Zionists, Habima dedicates itself to performing in Hebrew and moved to Moscow in 1917, becoming one of the national companies of Konstantin Stanislavsky's Moscow Art Theater where there were also Ukrainian and Armenian national groups. While there, Nahum's younger brother, Benjamin, also studies dance and later becomes a noted American choreographer, as well as a teacher of Stanislavski's acting technique. In 1919, Habima, wanting to perform Dybbuk in Hebrew, asks Zionist poet Chaim Nachman Bialik to translate it. The following photos belonged to Zemach, and I thank his daughter Amiel for their loan. The Armenian director, Evgeny Vakhtangov, a protege of Stanislavski, directs it. Hospitalized and in a bed next to a rabbi, Vakhtangov sees how the rabbi's emotions are expressed in his gestures and decides to stretch them beyond realism to carry more meaning. This made possible the leap from Stanislavski's naturalism to the supernaturalism of the Dybbuk's spirit world. The larger expressionist gestures, makeup and sets, along with the folk music and dance that Ansky had collected, created a modern expression of the mystical, Hasidic and Kabbalistic world. Note the exaggerated gestures and the unfurling of not a flag, but the words Shema Yisrael, held high across the top of the stage, as if to say, this is who we are. The Jewish and Gentile art world attended, none of whom knew Hebrew, but mysterious and mystical, with music and movement, it was a great success. Dybbuk was the perfect vehicle for Habima's agenda to create work with the archetypal universality of biblical characters and events. It remains the most produced Jewish play in the world. Now to the 1937 film. It was a Polish Jewish production using both traditional music from the play and a score by Henech Kohn. Realistic in costumes, makeup, and scenery, it keeps the play's supernatural character through movie magic. As one of the first films to superimpose images to erase the boundaries between life and life beyond death. With my editor, Lucinda Luvas, we used it in remix to visualize my feelings of possession by the past and my wish to connect with it as I danced. The Dybbuk film choreographer was Judith Berg. Coming from a traditional family, she knew the wedding dances, but also studied modern dance in Lodz, and then dance expressionism in Dresden with the major figure of that new style, Mary Wigman. It was a form that sometimes used masks and grotesque movement, as it was called, meaning stylized or unnatural, again, to emphasize themes and emotions. Berg had worked with several Yiddish theater companies, given dance concerts, and one of the few accredited modern dance studios in Warsaw. Later, she escaped to Russia ahead of the Germans, married actor-dancer Felix Fibisch, performing with him in the Soviet East during World War II, and after started a dance school at a DP camp. Coming to the U.S. in 1950, they taught and toured throughout North and South America. In 2010, I met and interviewed Felix, a cherished Yiddish folk dance teacher, until his death in 2014. Berg was the right match for a film needing traditional dances and something otherworldly. In a grotesque mitzvah dance, death comes to dance with Leah, 
and she sees her dead beloved in its skeletal face. His lost soul has been brought back by her love. Death is continually present in the story, but so is memory and what goes wrong when a vow is forgotten and an identity hidden. The characters are haunted by the past before it is revealed. Death, though, is not the theme of Dybbuk or Remix. For Leah, it's a beginning and a reunion with her destined love. For me, my adventures have been a revelation and a reunion of the secular dance artist I became with my Yiddish self, who spent her first four years as Bluma Karen, named for my mother's beloved mother. This is the prologue of the Dybbuk, quietly chanted before the lights come up. Why, oh why, did the soul plunge from the utmost height to the lowest depth? The seed of redemption of the upward flight is contained within the fall, unquote. The cycle of life continues. One last note from Ukraine. Three years ago, I learned that many of Ansky's original wax cylinders still existed. They came to light in the mid-1990s, when the Jewish section of Ukraine's Vernadsky National Library gathered collections forgotten or hidden from Soviet policies adverse to Jewish materials. They were digitized in Kyiv by the Institute for Information Recording of Ukraine's Academy of Science, and four CDs titled Treasure of Jewish Culture in Ukraine were made. For a 2006 Stanford University conference on Ansky, an album titled The Upward Flight was created by performer and musicologist Michael Alpert. It contains several of those old recordings. Michael's arrangement of Dybbuk Negan from the film and the play is in remix. He connected me to Lyudmila Sholokhova, who cataloged the recordings at the Vernatsky. Now at the New York Public Library, she connected me to the Recording Institute. Two months before the invasion of Ukraine, I was able to license one of those original recordings from the Institute, which opens my film. I hope the cylinders are once again hidden, but not forgotten. Wow. Karen, that was so moving, so moving. I mean, you know, weaving together that whole history. I, I know that you can amplify each one of those parts <laughs> to an entire talk by itself about Benjamin Zemach and, and, uh, and Miriam Rocklin and, uh, you know, all of that. But, yes. And, and Zanski, I, I know that. So thank you for, <laughs> you know, making, making this, this beautiful tapestry for us. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So I, that really is, shows, I think, how connected everything is. And then the story of, of the Dipic itself is about the connection that goes beyond life or life as we know it now. Um, uh, so, yeah, and, and you know, these things arise as, as I work on things. So as I was writing this paper and as I've done the other work, it's like, oh yeah, I see the connections and, and who knew who and who led me there. And, you know, um, we have a wonderful small world uh, in the Yiddish world. And yes. it's very easy to connect with, you know, the people who are important and, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and they're available because they all want to share. And, and I have really been the recipient of that many times over. 
Um, I Oh, I see a few questions. So the first one I already saw from uh, Naomi. And guess what, Naomi? Um, I would have to listen to the music again to um, pay attention to that. Um, I can't think of it offhand because obviously my focus has been elsewhere. But um, uh, if you leave me your email, um, I'll get back to you. Um, thank you, Jason Mann. I appreciate it. Um, let's see, do we have any more questions here? Uh, again, oh, let's see, from Maria Rubin, are those four CDs from Wax Cylinders available to, available to the public and if so, where? Um, honestly, I don't know because this, what, what I played was on this particular CD that I talked about that Michael had arranged. And I know that that was um, a, a limited uh, release mainly for people at that conference that I mentioned at Stanford. Um, so- But, but I, think, I think it is available. I think that CD is available. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I have a copy, but I just can't remember the title of it. Michael's? Uh, yeah, Michael's. Uh, Michael's um, is called The Upward Flight. Um, and uh, you and I both have come because we know him. Um, yeah, yeah. So, see connections. Um, it's it's, uh, but it, it's worth looking, googling around for, um, to see if they can be purchased. <clears throat> Interestingly, like the the people that I contacted um, at the um, Institute for Recording Information did leave Ukraine shortly after the uh, Russian invasion. So um, uh, I don't know where they are exactly. Um, um, yeah, so I, I can't tell you anymore. Again, let me, let me give my email out and then anybody feel free to contact me about any of these and I can do a little more research into if they are or not. So you can, Reach me at Karen Goodman, all small letters, one word, 930. Karen Goodman, 930 at Gmail. And uh, I'll be happy to answer anything that I think I can answer. Let's see what else we got here. Naomi Green. Okay, there's Naomi's email. Andrea White. Where and when did you first show your film? What was the response? Um, because this is kind of special material um, in terms of anything having to do with Yiddish. Um, the audiences and, and all of these festivals that I were in, all six, um, were not, some of them were just online, so I cannot tell you. The response that I can tell you is I got chosen <laughs> for, these, for these six, and you know, they were not major festivals. Uh, but one of them was um, the Punta del Este uh, Jewish Film Festival in a little resort town outside of um, Montevideo, Uruguay. And one of them was a larger festival um, that, because of COVID, was also online because it was these were shown um, just a little over a year ago. So it was December of 2022. And um, uh, what did I, and you know, a sense of appreciate, appreciate, appreciation I got was in, in the fact that they then interviewed me and I had a, a um, oh, what do you call it? Um, a podcast interview with um, one of the, of the directors of the festival who uh, was in London, but this festival was highlighting Eastern European films from Warsaw and two other cities. And um, so, I, I, you know, that was a great honor for me to be, to be shown amongst those films. 
Um, what else can I tell you about that? So, and then, and then out here, so um, there was the Culver City Film Festival, which actually was shown on the big screen um, at a, a big, uh, you know, cineplex in LA. And um, there is a process for blowing it up. So it was on the whole screen and it, that was quite thrilling to watch because um, it's the only time I've ever seen it on anything beside a computer and uh, it transferred really well. So, and there were several dance films featured. That was a festival for anything. And um, it won best dance video. So um, yeah, and then the others were just, yeah, I got into the festival, it was shown, which was, you know, pretty good for a little thing that I had no plan for at all. Literally, I was on this tour, we were in the Kashmir's Dolna, and I realized that that's where some of the Dybbuk had been filmed. There was that little synagogue that you see me in. Um, that beautiful music was playing and I really, I had to dance. And so we came back sort of after hours at the end of the day and um, I, I asked our resident scholar um, if he would do that. And I just gave him my iPhone. So that was shot on an iPhone and massaged in editing um, and made to look, you know, as, as good as it does, which was, Amazing. Oh, an example of the musical aspect of it. Um, the music of me dancing in the synagogue. I only had the sound recording from my phone and it took me like two years to find the person to contact because I wrote several times to the synagogue and they didn't answer. And finally they did and they, they told me of the group that made the recording, I contacted them. They said, contact their management, who was you know the distributor and now owned it. We did that. That guy didn't answer me. Um, um, fortuitously, my husband is a copyright attorney. So he wrote them a letter on his letterhead and that they responded to, you know, and for a very small reasonable fee, and so I got to have a good recording. So it, it all took time. I filmed this, the filming itself of the dancing, which all of this comes from, um, was in 2016. Um, I made a short version for a conference I was going to, and then I just saw that I could do a little more with it. And so more came and, uh, um, and this is the final result about six years later. Let's see what else we got. So that was that question. Uh, was I part of our TEF? Um, I'm old, but I'm not that old, I'm afraid. Um, the people who were part of our TEF were born in like the 1880s. And, um, and I believe the, the group broke up at some point, maybe in the 30s or so. Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, the questions keep coming. And so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Um, oh, here's someone from Los Angeles, Jane. Um, where in Los Angeles can we gather to learn and experience and do more traditional and ecstatic dance? I'm not sure that any of that's going on right now, frankly. Um, we tried a few years ago, but stay in touch. You have my email and I, there is somebody else I know who asked about it recently. And I, I know a musician here who was at least for a while having um, um, get togethers with musicians to play klezmer. And he had asked me if I wanted to lead dances and I wasn't able to at that point. So let's see, um, be in touch. Thank you, Terry, uh, for your comment. Um, what else, Andrea, thank you, we loved it. Was the cameraman our Richard Hecht? Yes, it was. Um, as I said, he was the scholar for that tour 
Um, and I will, I will say that that was a special study tour led by um, Rabbi Chaim Beliak, who is very involved in promoting and growing um, Jewish, um, it's, well, his group is called Jewish Renewal in Poland. And there are many people who are part Jewish um, or were hidden and they want to be involved. They want to study, people are converting. And um, so that is a really important and wonderful thing that's happening. And our Richard Hecht is um, a, a professor emeritus of religion at uh, UC Santa Barbara and just a wonderful, knowledgeable person. Um, Maria, all the images I showed, um, the music, the movie, everything, very poetic. That's how I feel when I'm exposed to Yiddishkeit. Um, the poetry is wonderful. I've, I've been taking Yiddish classes, or I did for about 20 years, not so good at it, but the poetry is really wonderful. Um, and whatever you can read in translation is always important. Um, Let's see, somebody just gave us some information here. Lynn, try Chicago for great Yiddish dancing. Mm. The Maxwell Street. Okay, so that's true. They're in Chicago. Um, okay. I'm still going here. Uh, Judith. <laughs> Judith was on that trip with me to Poland, Judith, I, and about, I don't know, 15 other people or so. And it's a very special group of people who wanted to go and um, uh, we all loved being together. Um, Karen, um, yes. I just noticed that Mary um, left. She had told us ahead of time that she would have to leave early. Right. Um, I think that maybe we can end this here and people can get in touch with you by email and um, and send you their comments and any more questions that you have that you can answer them. Um, afterwards, I just wanted to say that it was absolutely amazing. I had no idea what to expect because I, I know that when you presented this um, film for us to show, as part of this program, it was not easy to put it in the format that we would be able to share it in a webinar like this. And I know how hard you worked to get it into shape where we could actually share it with you. And you did a fantastic job. Now that you have this, you'll be able to take it elsewhere all over the world with you. And it's wonderful to have that. I, I'm really, uh, I was very touched with how you started this program, talking about what's going on in the Ukraine today. It, it was very moving, all of it, that we are, we are, that Jewish history continues, and we're all part of it. Right. And, and these cultural aspects are so important to preserve and maintain. So thank you for your contribution to that. I, I have just quickly um naomi green the the comments disappeared and i was just in the middle of writing down your phone number i mean your your email if you would please put it in again right now is is the uh q a still enabled we're gonna have you're going to get a copy of the q a when this oh is, okay we'll get okay. a full transcript all, all the right. questions, everything that was there I just wanted to thank you again. I, I want to thank um, Miri, even though she's not here, for having this idea. It was wonderful. We would never have known about this without her. I want to thank Sharon Power, who really put a lot of work into making this presentation possible because it wasn't easy to do. You worked at it. She worked at it. So I want to thank everyone who came today. Yes. And yes. There will be a video available on our website, the committee, committeefreeyiddish.com. It should be available, oh, I would say in the next 10 hours or so at some point. And you can watch it again. And there is a link there to your film. 
which if people are interested, they can actually go to your website. And yes. Yes. So I really congratulate you and thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank and, you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And um, I know that I that I can speak for everyone. Every I share all the wows that you got. It was amazing. There was so much in it that I'm just my head is just swimming now. The, the history, the images, the dancing, the literature, the it, it, the artwork. It's just amazing. So thank you very, very much. And I think I'm going to close here. And thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you.